when did the Old Covenant end and when did the New Covenant begin? Hey, smart Christians. A very interesting question comes up when people talk about the thief on the cross. When he died, there are some that will say, well, things are treated differently with him because he died under the Old Covenant. But is that true? And what that makes us think of then naturally is when did the Old Covenant end and when did the New Covenant begin? Remember, the thief on the cross died after Jesus' death. Why is that important? Well, because of what Jesus said he came to do, what he came to put an end to, and what he came to inaugurate. Recall in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus makes a statement says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophet, which is the old covenant. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Well, how is that done? Well, let's step back a little bit and remember in Leviticus chapter 16 specifically, we're told about this day of atonement and how there is this priest that mediates between man and God. And then there's two other elements also at present at this atonement. There is this scapegoat whereby all the sins of the people are put on the head of the scapegoat and sent out into the wilderness. In other words, the scapegoat is carrying away the sins of the people. Well, John tells us that when he sees Jesus, he says, look, there's the Lamb of God who does what? Takes away the sins of the world. And so he's going to play the part of the scapegoat as well. Also, we have the sacrificial offering, this propitiation, this blood sacrifice that will atone for sin. Well, Jesus does the exact same thing as well. And so we've got a better, uh, if you will, better elements. We've got a better high priest, according to Hebrews. We've got a lamb that takes away all the sin, and we've got a propitiation of blood that is much better than what we had before. We'll cover the blood in just a second, but in this regard, he is a better sacrifice, and so we don't have a temporal atonement. Now we've got a permanent atonement, and even if we go to uh, Romans chapter 10, Paul makes this, clay, this, this case also. In chapter 10, verse 4, he says that for Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so it's clear that Jesus in his fulfillment of the law, the law requires that there be a sacrifice of propitiation that the people who believe and trust in what God is doing, in this case what Christ did on the cross, that they stand justified because he fulfills the law. And not just for a one-time uh, fulfillment that they're in right standing for one year. No, in this case, now they're in right standing. Those who have faith, they are in right standing permanently because of the effectiveness of his blood. Remember, we're told that uh, this is this blood that Jesus sheds uh, pays the debt and it deals with sin forever. There is no longer a payment required. So now, when Jesus dies, though, his death inaugurates a new covenant. Now, before we get into that, let's talk about the new covenant and just kind of get a picture and understanding of what the new covenant actually is. And so in Jeremiah chapter 29, I'm sorry, 31 verse, starting in verse 31, it says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them out of the, out by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, which is the old covenant, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. And he says in that, look what he says, I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sins no more. It needs to be stated that as this new covenant is in effect for Israel, it's not all the way complete. In other words, that not all of Israel is experiencing this because we find out later, we won't go into it, that there is this spirit of stupor, this partial hardening that's come over Israel. And so by and large, we've got an ethnic nation, Israel, that is refusing to place their faith in, the, in her Messiah, whereas other nationalities, other people group, just like Joel 2 says, other people are experiencing the Holy Spirit but there are still some Jews who are also doing so, but by and large, that group has rejected it for the most part. But there are some, remember that the church started off with Jews primarily, and then we see Gentiles brought in. But 
this issue of when the new covenant started, well, it's actually addressed in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is a book written to Jewish believers. And so it would make sense that this issue of the covenant is brought up, the ending of the old and the beginning of the new. The book of Hebrews is written to Jews who have placed their faith in the Messiah. However, in their mind, they have, they've got all these years, these thousands of years, as a matter of fact, of being entrenched with the law. And what does the law require? That there be this yearly sacrifice, this day of atonement, year after year after year. And there's this guilt that still deals with them when they sin, just like with us. If a true believer sins, that true believer is going to be remorseful and bothered by that sin. Well, in the case of these Jews, these Hebrews, their thought is, well, I must amend for my sin. There must be some sort of sacrificial offering. And the writer's trying to convey to them that you don't have to worry about that, that the, the actual sacrifice has been done. But I want to pay attention to, I want to look at a couple of passages to indicate when it ended, when the old ended. and But really, we, we know when it ended because we've been told that, but really when the new covenant began. In Hebrews chapter 9, let's start in verse 15. For this reason, he, that is Jesus, is a mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death, that is his death, obviously, has taken place for the redemption of transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, that is the old covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. That is obviously God or Jesus in this case. For covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never in force while the one who made it lives. And so they're pointing out this issue with this new covenant that it cannot be in force while, in this case, Jesus lives. Let's go back to it. He says, therefore, the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. And every covenant, as a matter of fact, we see the, uh, the old covenant. We see the, the Abrahamic covenant. We see that there be this blood sacrifice, this this blood, the shedding of blood that inaugurates the covenants. The Abrahamic covenant we see in, in uh, Genesis 15. And then we see this in Exodus uh, with this brand new covenant, this new covenant, actually at the time it was a new covenant, it's an old covenant, this Mosaic covenant, the law, we see that there. And so that's what he's speaking of. And so verse 19, he states that for when, ev for, for when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats and water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God commands. And so he's reiterating that even that old covenant was inaugurated with blood. Why is that important? Because what, how's a new covenant going to be inaugurated for these people with blood as well? So let's go to it. He says, verse 21, and in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and the vessels of ministry with the blood. According to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed by the blood and without the shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness. So now it's clear that what has to happen is there has to be, obviously we see that Jesus fulfills the old covenant, the law, the requirement that there be this sacrifice, in this case, a better sacrifice, but his shedding of the blood on the cross is the institution, the inauguration of this new covenant. And granted, the fulfillment of it has not been totally thorough, but it has started. There are some that believe that it hasn't started. I believe that it has because of the very fact that um, it could not be that these people were in the midst of or the, the middle of uh, no covenant, the old covenant, nor under the new covenant. So what are Jews who have not placed their faith in? How are they living? Well, even though they're acting under the old uh, the new covenant is what's been established now. That's the covenant that God has, and God has really not paid any attention to the old covenant, so to speak. Um, it's it's done away with. As a matter of fact, let's go to uh, some more interesting details about the old covenant as it relates to or contrasting with the new covenant. In chapter 10, verse 1, he says, For the law, that's the old covenant, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things can never, by the same sacrifice which they which they continually offer year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not cease to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sin. And so the issue is the old covenant could not cleanse people of sin. Two things are missing. The dealing with sin, and there's also a way to make these people in right standing whereby when they do die, they can still, or they can then go and be with the Father. That could not happen under the old covenant. And so let's go back to it. He says, 
in verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin year by year, which he wants to take away with verse 4, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. However, Jesus' blood is not the same sort of blood sacrifice. It's a much better sacrifice. And in verse 5, he says, therefore, when he comes to the world, he says, that's Jesus, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In a whole burnt offering and sacrifice for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. And look what he says. After saying above, sacrifice and offering and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired. Let's drop down verse nine. Then he said, behold, I have come not to do your will. He takes away the first. He takes away the first, which is the old covenant to establish the second, which is the new covenant. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. And so here we have, we see that the taking away of the old covenant is now supplanted by the bringing of the new covenant all in one act what he did on the cross ended the old and brought about the new so going back to the question that gets brought up when the thief on the cross died did he die under the old covenant because it's brought up when people ask well why didn't the thief on the cross uh did he need to be baptized and we say that baptism water baptism is not necessary for salvation and a perfect example is the thief on the cross who is not uh, baptized, but is promised to, to have um, salvation. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Well, paradise is in heaven now. At the time, it was not. And we'll deal with that at a different time. That's a different discussion. But he's promised salvation, though he's not uh, baptized in physical water, which means it could not be the requirement for salvation, physical water baptism. But some will say, but no, he was he, he died under a different dispensation. He died under the old covenant. But he could not have died under the old covenant because Jesus' death ended the old covenant and inaugurated the new covenant. If someone disagrees, well, the question is going to be, well, when did the new covenant start? The new covenant started, according to these passages that we just read, at the shedding of the blood. That's what inaugurated the new covenant, just like it's what inaugurated the old covenant, just like it's what inaugurated the Abrahamic covenant. And so it should be clear. The old covenant and the new covenant had the exact same end date and start date. 